Hello. Hello. I'm and guilty. Of? Sorry, sorry, it came out a little bit too soon. Of pleasure. <gasps> Gross. Right. I'm growing hands on... Bar, fuck. I'm growing... <laughs> what was that? You grow hair, hair on your, your hand, palms, palms of your, your hands. hands. Yes. Um, I have driven something that is a guilty pleasure, and I feel good about it. And when I say guilty, let me just say this directly to the camera. I am not saying I'm guilty of breaking any traffic laws, because I would never do such a thing. But I did some stupid... Very not, legal. Not stupid. No, no, no. Offensive shit in an offensive vehicle, and I had a lot of fun doing it. That's perfectly on brand for you, actually. Damn it. It was supposed to be a guilty pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, it's just an extension of yourself. Um, so, yes, this episode, welcome to the Carmudgeon Show, to the 103rd, we think, episode of the Carmudgeon Show, part of the Haggerty Podcast Network, presented by the Jason Camisa and me. Uh, Derek Tam Scott. Derek Tam Scott. Uh, and this episode is about some automotive guilty pleasures and then a whole bunch of other sort of random stuff that we happened to also talk about, including a rant against the BMW i3 oh, no. as the um, future of sustainability, which we never got, thankfully. Uh, and which is then, what it sounded like when the range extender was running. Yes. And apparently just dangerously undrivable when also, the range extender's going. They like to roll over. It was a very oh, aggressive perfect. roll mitigation. So anyway. Uh, so you know what in doesn't contrast right. to that is the Lucid Air, yes. uh, which is continuing, uh, Lucid is continuing to sponsor us mm -hmm. for reasons which... Just don't ask. Okay, I'm not asking. Uh, yes, and so we all know about the Lucid Air, uh, which is the longest range, fastest charging luxury electric car in the world, designed here in California and produced in Arizona. Uh, and Jason, who has Liv um, literally driven the tires off, of <laughs> the tires off of one and extolled its many virtues. Best EV sports sedan. Period. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And faster than a Bugatti Veyron. Pure sport. Sorry. Quicker. Chiron. Quicker. Quicker. Not faster. Chiron pure sport. Yes. Maybe we should do a rematch. Now that the, the Sapphire is in production. Oh. Uh, anyway. Go, can we okay, yes, think? right. Sorry. Uh, and of course, we the, the, the real reason is that we want to talk about this is that there are special lease and finance offers available on the 2023 models of the Lucid Air Touring and Grand Touring, which will allow buyers to get a new lease on electric and uh, which they can learn more about if they visit lucidmotors.com for details on the offer great i suggest you all do that yes Fully i mean i would if i could afford it but uh have you know. lucid keep sponsoring us and maybe we'll be able to afford or this. maybe the lease offers really are that good i don't know you should check it out because maybe just maybe a large full-size luxury electric sedan would be your guilty pleasure that's true yeah, well done. Okay, well, without further ado, uh, let's get this show on the road or off-road, potentially, given that you were driving a truck. Off on in Mexico. Yes. Off the road. Uh, so what's this episode about? You say that right after Paolo hits the record button? Well, first, let me just say I'm exhausted. Um because this week was uh, Revelations filming. And so by way of background, Revelations is shot in a studio that's only like 10 minutes from my house. So it's easy and convenient. And Anthony flies in from the East Coast. He lives, uh, he doesn't matter where he lives, flies in from the East Coast and he stays at my house while he's here. So we are like, once he touches down, it's 100% work 100% of the time. It's also hanging out with my best friend. So it's awesome. But however, it ended last night, well, technically 630 this morning when he left my house. I am exhausted uh, because those are those are very, very long days. Mm -hmm. We get up at six and we get home. Shoot at like days midnight. always are. Yeah, so I feel like I've been hit on the head with a brick. Probably were you as part of the shoot i mean you never know is one of your <laughs> episodes. we had a couple of fun moments so this one was i guess i can tell you guys because you're my friends we did we did miata um and we did uh nsx first gen nsx mm -hmm. um so it's fun because we did two two na's mm -hmm. I mean, the NA1 for, NA1 and and NA1. NA1. <laughs> they were both yes. they're both na1s um mm -hmm. funny enough um and they were like ha, ah, they're both the same color until you put them next to each other and then the miata is a deep red and the uh, nsx is a vibrant red and 
It's things you don't realize until you see them. Uh, but the Miata one was fun. We had uh, we had a special guest star of a Lotus Elan Series Two, also in red, which was one of the cars that. Um, that they had in the studio at Mazda as inspiration for the Miata. And it is obvious when you look at them side by side. Very much so. Except it takes a very special car to make a Miata look like a friggin' SUV. Mm -hmm. And it does look like a friggin' SUV. Did you drive the Elan? I did not. Oh. I really wanted to, but it wasn't running properly. Um, I think the owner... Have you driven one before? No. Ah. Uh-oh. Why? They're cool. It's a, it is a very uh, elemental, like... You couldn't take much out of that car and have it still be a car yeah, type of car. It's very delicate. You try the shifter? I did. That, I think, beats the Miata. I know. That's possibly the best shifter I've ever but felt. But also very obviously benchmarked. The position oh, of the yeah. center console yep. and, mm -hmm. and the shift action and the uh, throw, mm -hmm. very similar. Yeah, without question. I mean, it's bo they're both right up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we wound up using the shifter, as a, the, the sound of the shifter as a as a punctuation mark when we were recording. We'll see what if it winds up in the edit, but like it just got, does this bolt rifle, just yeah. um, amazing. Um, the owner, I think, is the coolest owner we've ever had, and that's a high bar, because we've had some great owners of cars, but he just towed it here, we drove it in, he was like, it's not running right, meanwhile, it sounded spectacular, just idling. Um, it's a twin cam with, twin cam with Webers? With Webers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, very, very, very nice car. Um, and, uh, and then we had a special guest person, Tom Matano, showed up, uh -huh. um, who is basically the one of the fathers of the Miata. It had many, many. And still Miata's very... Miata's was a whore. Um, <laughs> everybody had a ride. Yeah. Uh, he is still very invested in the Miata community, yeah. very up, active, very enthusiastic. Showed up. We heard him from around the block. He's got quite the exhaust on his NA uh -huh. um, Miata, and he showed up. It's this beautiful blue with a gray interior, and he was, you know, he's a designer. So he's like, I wanted the blue to match my, uh, the interior to match my hair. And he pulls off his hat, and he's all gray. And so he wanted a gray interior <laughs> so it would match his gray hair. Um, you know the story of the, supposedly, I don't know, I mean, you, Tom, I guess, would be the person to ask about this. The color, that shade of blue, uh, maritime blue or whatever. Is that this what wasn't it's maritime. This Mariner is the, blue. This is a 96 special edition. Oh, I see. Which he got because he wanted the gray interior. Ah. Uh. The Mariner blue, which is the early bright blue, mm -hmm. supposedly that color is um, to match the California blue license plate. That was the oh. inspiration for that color. Yeah. I've heard. I don't that's, know if that's true. We can ask him. Yeah, um, yeah but uh, that is not what this episode's about. This episode is These, about... This episode of Revelations or this episode of Carmudgeon? No, this episode of Carmudgeon. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, because... I uh, just still don't know what it's about. Well, you're going to in a second, because I had an experience on the way here that was like the most awesome thing. Today? No, no. Um, to shooting. Sorry. I'm not. I've had no coffee. Can we get coffee up here? I've had no coffee. Um, <laughs> or just a smidge, like oh, two pots. That's a joke. On the way to filming, I was in a Raptor R, which is... I the Raptor Raptor R. It is my favorite car in production right now. It is bat it's shit not a car. absurd vehicle. It's a car. It's a vehicle. Whatever. It is bat shit nuts. All right. So we Ford dropped it off. It, it was it's the press car, and I it was the week of filming, so I didn't have time to like really do anything other than commute back and forth to the studio. And it is the most fun you can have in a car. Uh, in so <laughs> the the first time I get in it, I you know immediately go to Baja mode on the exhaust, which is the loudest, and it's obscene. Sorry, is this one a V8 or is it still a V6? V8. Supercharged V8 from okay. the GT500. So this is the which, answer to the like, hey, the Raptor has gone turbo V6, yeah. like how erection deflating for all of the truck bros. So now, you know. I ne never quite thought of it in those terms, but yes. A, a disappointment. I'm sure they did. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, yeah. Supercharged V8 mm -hmm. from the GT500. Which making is making 740 horsepower again still in the last time. I don't know what it is in the Raptor. I haven't even looked yet. Like this was the joke as I drove it. I made my notes. I will go and I will go and formulate my thoughts uh, and look up all the stats because who cares about stats? Here's the deal. So we're sitting at a red light. I go into Baja mode and it's, you know, it goes from at this light. And right as I do that, I see a woman who's behind us inching over to the right. Um, 
to go make a right on red. And there's there's enough room to quote George Carlin for the Romanian army to get through there. But she's going at approximately 0.0003 miles an hour, all scared of this <laughs> raptor that's taking up the entire lane and then some. Um, and she's eking through. And when I hit the Baja button and the exhaust open, I saw her sort of flinch in the rearview mirror. And that kind of tickled me. Like, <laughs> okay, like, sorry. And then the light turned green. And I figured the thing that I could do to be the most polite possible would be to extricate myself quickly from the circumstances. Mm -hmm. from the Thereby providing her enough room to complete her right turn. I think she died. Oh, <laughs> so she never completed her right turn <laughs> it, due to death. Okay, so with stability on, they, they have programmed the stability perfect because it's got these big K2 off-road tires and they love a lot of slip and they break through like mar break away like marshmallows. Or they're amazing. One of the reasons I love the Bronco Raptor so much is these tires because they're just howling all the time and they're mushy and whatever. Yeah. It fucking ignited the tire. It's rear drives nominally. It ignited the rear tires and she flinched and I just saw her like, you know, jump out of her skin in the car and I never saw her again because then it slam shifts the one, two, lights them up again and burned tire the entire way through second gear, which by the way, takes a fraction of a second. Is this um, a 10 speed? It's uh, nine, 10. It's gotta be the 10. Um, and then goes into third and continues the fucking burnout, but hooks up at five grand in third, but then breaks loose again at six. There's so much top end on this V8. I've never, ever been in a truck with this much top end power. It's absurd, but it continue basically did a quarter of a mile burnout. Um, mm. But in the most perfectly controlled way with the most violent soundtrack I've ever heard, I did not get video and I'm really sorry, but we just had this like absolute laugh out loud moment where this poor woman clearly expired at the expense of the noise that this thing made, right? Uh. So Anthony in the passenger seat is like, ah, it doesn't sound, it doesn't feel all that fast. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, this is a three point something second car. And I floor it again. And just horks, like horks, lifts them basically the front off the ground and takes off. And he's like, nah, you know, it's quick. So I go and I put the exhaust in quiet mode and I floor it on the, high, we were on the highway at this point, like 60 miles an hour and I nail it. And now it's, and just 60 to hundred, like, <laughs> like a quarter of a second. And he's like, right, 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 holy shit. And it's just, once you get the noise level down to the, to a reasonable level, you can concentrate on the speed. So he's like, but it, you know, it's really fast and it's got all that top end, but I, I don't know. It didn't feel fast. So we're at a red light <laughs> and I have it in normal mode now, which is pretty quiet, not crazy quiet. And I, without him noticing, I sneak over and I put it in four wheel drive and the light turns green and I just brake torqued it for a split second <clears throat> and went and it lit up all four tires. <laughs> There's somebody next to me. I'm sure they all expired because a bunch of people in that car just lifted up the front, lit up all four wheels and did it a beautiful, perfect four wheel burnout through first and halfway through second hooked up and had to, that had to have been like a three, six or something to 60. So did you get any numbers? No, but, but what I did was get an idea because mm -hmm. we've been fighting for trying, fighting to try to get cars for Cooter ultimate drag race replay. And it's, very difficult to do. I know it shouldn't be, but the manufacturers don't want to lose. And this is instrumented testing. So we know what the outcome is going to be roughly before we get there. We, I retest the cars, but everyone was like, well, that car's faster. So, so the, manufacturers. the manufacturers, like the owners usually don't care. They're cool. But the manufacturers are like, we can't lose because we're pansies and fucking whatever. Remember the word pansies. I just did that for a reason. Okay. Um, the, uh so we're on the highway on the way to the uh, to the studio yesterday last day and we wind up pacing a cullinan a rolls royce cullinan and i look over and this gentleman is clearly not the owner of the car uh i had manufacturer plates on is either a journalist or somebody who worked for rolls as far as i'm concerned he just didn't look like the usual cullinan driver mm -hmm. in a good way so i look over to him and he just looks, catches me and Anthony looking right at him. I'm like, so embarrassing. Like, Ant starts laughing like, oh, no. But, like, here we are, like, two doofuses in a raptor mm -hmm. are looking over. And he looks over, and I just go, oh. <laughs> like, just make the, oh, aren't you fancy? And Rolls Royce. And floor it. And so does he. <laughs> I just, Sorry, are you stationary or at speed? No, we're on the highway. We're, uh, we're already doing yes, right. doing uh, 20. <clears throat> 
kilometers. per hour. Kilometers, 12. <laughs> yeah, well. Per 1.6 <laughs> minutes of, yes, got it. What ensued was a little impromptu drag race, high-speed drag race, followed by a little bit of lane chess, which was the funniest fucking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, this rolls was very quick. Not as quick as the Raptor, I think. So now we're like, we have to get Raptor and a Cullen in for a cooter. Like we have to drag race these cars because the visual alone was just, we were hysterical. He was laughing. Everyone around us was laughing at the sight of these two houses drag racing down the highway repeatedly from like 60 to 63 uh, in a 65 zone because we would never go faster. It was awesome. It was awesome. It was a moment of joy that I have not had on a commute to this friggin' office in a while which led me to the purpose of this episode. So, okay, let me try to guess. Um, everyone should commute. No, that's not it. No. Uh, everyone should commute in a house. Everyone should be in a house. Everyone should work from home and not commute. Everyone should work from home and not commute, so I can do terrible things on the road when I have to commute, but that's not it. Um, is the fast house vehicle the new... Maximum form of entertainment. Yes, but that's not the purpose of the episode. Can you imagine a, a motorhome with a jet engine? I, that would be fun. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just, I kept imagining if this V8 were in the Raptor, uh, the Raptor, the Bronco Raptor, mm -hmm. I think I would sell a bunch of cars to own one because it would be the world's most perfect every day. Does it all, stupid. What prevents um, the, uh, the, truck one from doing that the size uh i was told the frame cannot the front cradle cannot sorry what prevents oh. the the uh, the pickup truck uh raptor r from being the ultimate uh everyday vehicle oh it's too big for me the size just, yeah i mean it's, but for most americans that's not true yeah that's true so it's, for them they w should buy one. Oh yeah okay oh yeah there you go oh yeah, yeah. no no if you're in the market for a raptor r <laughs> yes the answer is just fucking yes yeah as long as you don't the live regular in uh, tokyo even and especially then, can you imagine that thing on surrounded by K cars running them over like they're like they're like pebbles? Yeah, but then you can't ever park. That's not your problem. You helicopter out. It's okay, fine. take your little submarine. To, oh, too oh, soon. too soon. That is genuinely tragic. Um, however, no, I think this episode is about automotive guilty pleasures mm. because. We just bought it together, a 3,240 pound Rover, which is by a large, large margin, my heaviest car, collector car. Huge margin. Mm, it's not that. What is the 200 what pounds is the heavier? 220 200 pounds, pounds heavier than, than the, the Ferrari. Ferrari, which is your next heaviest right. car. And that, it's, that car at 3020 is 200 pounds heavier than my, the next car. I mean, which is my, a four door Mercedes. I think the E30 is heavier than the which is a five-door station wagon, BMW. They're all, I mean, the cars are 1600, 1683, I think it is for the Beat, 1992 for the for the Elise, 2356 for the Scirocco, 2399 for the Cabby, 20, I haven't weighed Beatrice, but she should be somewhere in the 27s, the, and the wagon, and the, uh, the 2316 are both in the 28s. And then the Ferrari's 3020, and here's this fat pig Rover at 30. 200 pounds. I'm interested to get it on the scales to see precisely how much it I actually is. We'll try to do that today. Um, but the point is, I get into a 7,000 pound, whatever the fuck, who cares? 700 plus horsepower V8 supercharged full size Raptor the size of my house. And it's so not me. And I love everything about it. So maybe, uh, yeah, you're expanding your horizons. No, I've always kind of had a guilty truck pleasure. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I mean, there's full size trucks have a. First of all, the utility is unmatched, except mm -hmm. almost my van. The, mm -hmm. the van almost, the van comes close. Unless you're towing. Unless you're towing. But you can't. Case the transmission on the van. Well, the, va the transmission on the van will expire even if you. It can hear oh, you. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's in there with the rover. They're, they're sort of commiserating on and, and planning. <laughs> on being the fat kids. Who's, yeah, oh, sorry, the fat guys. kids. I love the, you. <laughs> um, no, but it, so do you not have automotive guilty pleasure oh yes but also i'm more of a whore than you so there's fewer things that are outside of my realm of like um acceptability right i don't have these hard and fast rules like you have about uh weight or transmission or aspiration 
you always you always color yourself as like Mr. Manual Transmission, Mr. Naturally Aspirated, Mr. Lightweight. And if you have defined your automotive enthusiasm mm -hmm. in those terms, then there's a lot of things that you could characterize as guilty pleasures. All that having been said, I really, my probably- I just come back to you're a whore. <laughs> you <laughs> you know, I didn't hear anything else. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I've owned a lot of like, you know, I, I drove here in my Citroen. Like that's not characteristic for me, really. It's front yes, wheel drive. Well, it's okay, absurd. so then how would you character? So mine is absurdity, no, which means no, no, anything no. fits if, if my automotive yeah, brand is absurdity. Yeah, but what doesn't fit is a Camry. Yes, that's right. true. I shouldn't say absurd. Your car your car taste tends to be eccentric is probably what I Yes. Say. The weirder sure. and the more off the beaten path, the more you're interested in it. Not entirely true. Like I have a 911 that's air-cooled. That's like the least off the beaten. Point, uh, see, I'm a whore. This is the, the, the point here is that I'm a whore. Uh, I mean, I've always had a, bit, a thing for big sedans like mm -hmm. e38. like e38 w uh the w140 which i'm really enjoying i've always wanted a bentley turbo r i have owned a v12 jaguar xj so hmm. you know there's like the big sedan yeah. thing which i am really into or like moderately into um you know trucks i have n i guess i did have a cayenne and i had a range rover and a defender uh but okay. uh my Equivalent, I guess, would be the. F uh, I used to work at a company where we had to be towing a lot of uh, airplanes, actually, and we had an F three fifty turbo diesel mm -hmm. uh, crew cab long bed, and that I would for pay me good <laughs> money to see you climbing into that thing. Um, so I drove it quite regularly, and probably the most American moment in my entire life. Uh, because we were an airplane manufacturer, we would display at the America's largest air show, which is in Ashcash, Wisconsin, on the shores of uh, Lake Winnebago. And the truck would always be towing shit out there for the show. And uh, the it's a week-long show, and it's kind of like Car Week. It's just this huge, overwhelming thing where every day there's 73,000 things going on. There's two air shows. There's fireworks. Twice, like It's just this huge production. And, and by the time you get to Thursday, you're just like, please take me out back and euthanize me or something. I've had so much beer and cheese curds, and I'm so tired of standing in the sun and the humidity, and et cetera. Thursday night is the Seaplane Pilots Association um, corn roast, and seaplane pilots are like... Where we're going, we don't need runways, you know? They're like, <laughs> if pilots are a little bit wacky, they're like, fucking, I will go anywhere and do anything, and they're just really like... But they're also supremely nerdy. Anyway, so the the, the we all pile into the F-350 and go over to the Seaplane Pilots Association, and, you know, it's the Midwest in the summertime, so invariably there are thunderstorms. It's a muddy grass field where you have to park, uh, and... We dropped everybody off and then had to go find somewhere to put the truck in. And there's a big, wet, grassy field. And my colleague looks over at me and just pushes the traction control button. And we're in this huge, grass, <laughs> muddy field with nothing around. What else? And it's in rear-wheel drive. Uh, and so, you know, I'm doing donuts in the F-350 in the mud. And then at this point... Uh, an F-18 flies by during the air show in full <laughs> afterburner. And so I'm just like, I'm literally in a field in Wisconsin doing donuts in an F-350 diesel while an F-18 flies by. Mm -hmm. This is the most American moment of my yeah. entire life. So yes, I mean, yeah, a big truck. I definitely have sort of enjoyment from that. I mean, it's not really dynamic. Although actually it was entertaining with a long wheelbase. Yeah. It's very easy to, yeah. to do Slide that. Around. And there, yes, there is, there is video, of course. I, I feel like I've seen this. I video. might have showed it yeah. to you. I mean, it's one of the defining <laughs> moments of my life, if I'm honest. America, fuck you! Yeah, I mean, as someone who grew up on the the West Coast, like the Midwest, well, the first time I went to Wisconsin, I was like, this looks like a cartoon. Like it, it looks like a movie. I didn't realize places like this actually existed mm -hmm. in America. In fact, it is most of America, as it turns out. Yeah. Uh, so geographically, if not uh, necessarily population. -wise. Yes, yeah. that's right. So that was a cultural experience. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, look, I grew up in New York and we didn't, and then, you know, high school in Germany, I didn't, the pickup thing, the first time I was ever in a pickup in my life, I think, or other than, you know, like a ride here, was, uh, a friend in college had one. And I'm like, this is wild. It was an S10. It was like, wow, this is crazy. There's no headrests. You're just right up against the glass. There's oh, no, yeah. It was just, a, you know, a short bed. Um, but a it was short a short cab. A short cab. Short cab and short, I think she had a short bed, but it was rear drive which was really fucking oh dumb. yes because there's no weight over the rear tires with comp tas mm -hmm. um <laughs> in the winter in potsdam new york uh we were stuck a lot but it had a 4.3 in it it was fast 
and when was, it would hook up. <laughs> well, I'm dry. I mean, yes. it would drive. It would just sort of, and that was my first experience. At, like, you like fast music dumb and, trucks, though. You know, it's like... Um, I, look, I love the Cyclone. Like the Cyclone. But the Cyclone is perfectly on brand for me, even though it's not. Oh, you mean because it's uh, well, un, if, unhinged? And... Like, it's all the things I don't do. I don't do V6s. I don't do turbochargers. Mm-hmm. I don't do automatics. I don't do, do all-wheel drive. And I've never done American, right? Or a truck. And a truck. I mean, it's just all those things. Well, I did a truck. I had, a, I had my Susu poop. Pop. My excuse you poop. Um, but, but in the genre of trucks, it's the... St- it's it's a K car, right? It's tiny. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna have to take up the picture and of it's it very next to a TRX. Yeah, it's little, it's lightweight, it's very quick. Um, but what is totally outside of my like you know wheelhouse is a full size, like something like a Raptor. But I can say that I mean Bronco Raptor filming last year that episode is I probably had more fun in that Bronco Raptor than any other car we've filmed other than GR86. Mm-hmm. Um, and now. Raptor R. <laughs> I so mean, drag race. Yeah, I really want a drag race. That, I mean, if we can get it, what I'd like to do is the heavy, we, we, and I were joking last night about calling this episode the heavyweight. So you have a Raptor R, Durango Hellcat, if we can get one, because I don't want all pickup trucks um, instead of TRX, but you know, TRX is the obvious choice, but then it just becomes all pickups. But Raptor R. Cullinan is not a pickup truck. Yeah, that's why I don't want all pickup trucks. So if I can get a, uh, I can get a Durango, Cadillac Escalade V, which is, if you remember, so loud that I got a, I got pulled over for. Is that the uh, CT5 V powertrain? It's the Blackwing powertrain in <laughs> in the Escalade. It's yeah. Stupid. Okay. Uh, and then M2 because it weighs a thousand pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. We just we do, we're talking like no one's done a real drag race of the M2 yet. And we're like going through like okay, we can we can do this, but what do we put it up against? And then we're like it's like it's twelve seconds flat. It's like directly on top of Raptor and all these other cars. So we we can have it there as the benchmark of this is how fast these stupid trucks are. And you know, like the, I'll make a joke about it being heavy and then probably never get put in BMW again. Um, but uh, the M2 is a benchmark and I'd like to use it as that. So we may make a little okay. joke on it, but if we can put that drag race together, I think we'll laugh our asses off. Um, especially if I can get um, Randy Popes in a smoking jacket. <laughs> For the Rolls Royce. For the Rolls Royce, yeah. Or in the backseat of you know one who's eating crumpets or whatever it is that Rolls Royce people um, do. New Rolls Royce or old Rolls Royce? Oh, no, Cullinan. I know, no, Rolls Royce people, though. New Rolls Royce people or old Rolls Royce people, right? It used to be a very aristocratic mark, and uh, now it's sort of nouveau riche. Well, the only person I've ever interacted with directly who drove, who owns a Cullinan is the guy who owns the Bugatti Chiron Pursport, Mm -hmm. who shipped we shipped the uh, bugatti down to the to the racetrack and he drove down in his um in his colon and, and made it in an exceptionally short amount of time mm-hmm. um, i mean obviously he was about. going the speed limit the entire time derek tam hyphen scott the speed um, limit of germany <laughs> no way <clears throat> of course not the speed limiter if no i mean uh but he and he was very cool so that's my only one interaction of Cullinan owners is that they're cool. Not very aristocratic though, right? Not none of this sort of like the the traditional British image of being, you know. I think they would find those cars rather gauche. Yes, I mean that exactly. car is uh, not, yeah, not in keeping. Not a paragon it. of traditional values. Is it though? I mean, it is large and <laughs> in charge and in charge and sort of blunt faced and all of the things that rolls. Rolls is is were. Mm. I don't know. That's a, that's an interesting question. Is whether, whether I think they'd find it immensely tasteless. I, to be honest with you, find most Rolls Royces immensely tasteless. Yes. I mean, I think they're purposefully new ones. Yes. Uh, weren't they always that way? Mm, uh, don't bring up that Camargue thing again. The Camargue. What about yeah. it? That, that that was the, the non tasteless. It was exquisite because it was designed by Pin and Frina. Whatever. No, no, that was a big departure for Rolls Royce because they went outside of England for something. Oh, fair enough. Right, it was like... Too bad not for the electronics. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, but that car was a huge departure, the Camargue. Mm-hmm. Traditionally, it would be like Phantom 3, the right. V12, you know, gurney, nutting, bodied, whatever. That is a real coach builder. Um, oh, I thought you... I was trying to figure <laughs> out that disgusting gurney, nutting, wow. Uh, that was wow. the first coach builder that came to mind. <laughs> 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 I mean, I don't know. 
Time is it? It's a little early, Derek. Uh, Van Voren, I don't know. Uh, uh, Thruppen Maberly. Uh, Excuse you. <laughs> uh, there, there was this whole... Anyway, we were talking about Rolls Royces. It, is that a guilty pleasure? That could potentially be a guilty pleasure, actually. I mean, if, if there are other genres of guilty pleasure. The only roles that I've ever... Old roles that I've really... In, two of them that I've interacted with. One was clearing up my friend Mike's estate. Um, and he had some silver shit box. And <laughs> it had a whole... Paraphrasing the, the model name. Yeah. It, it had holes in the floor and the exhaust manifolds came down and were not connected to the muffler. So you were treated to 100% fume in, in input and also the sound of a NASCAR V8. Because uncorked, these very, very Six sounds of V8, three quarter. they are quite Vocal. spicy. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And I drag raced everyone down through downtown West Palm Beach, laughing my ass off. So. Losing, but also. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, losing to Priuses and shit. They were just, they weren't, they weren't probably not even racing me. <laughs> very slow, but very vocal. And then, um, <laughs> what ear? So this is like a silver shadow silver or box. Yeah, 60. I feel like it was 68. Okay. So, yes, that's a silver shadow. Wow. It was it the was, first very innovative Rolls Royce, um, unitary construction. Oh. Well, it was, a, it was certainly rusting as one what cohesive unit. The second Rolls Royce that I interacted with, which I think actually was happened first, was one that we bought, my friend Bill and I bought out of the desert in Reno, maybe, that had been sitting outside for 30 years. Um, and what we were going to turn into a lemons car. Um, and it was purple, if I remember correctly. Oh, who knows what color it was originally, but it was sort of like some flat plum color. Um, and... We, it weighed enough that we I blew two trailer tires towing it home. I think it was f filled with sand. Um, I think like all of the crevices in the body had become filled with sand in the 30 years that this thing sat outside. It was a full-on biohazard. It was disgusting. And the idea was Bill, this is Bill Arnold, who's my Lemons race captain slash friend, had the idea, let's get this and throw like a panther bodied something underneath it. Because I think... That, no, his fucking hairbrained idea was we were going to throw an E38 underneath it. It was going to be a 7 Series. And I'm like, Bill, just because... Rolls Royce already did that yeah, just later on. Just because the wheelbase is similar doesn't mean, ah, how hard can it be? And he was just, was like, we're going to do a Panther chassis, like, frame. So, like, a, who knows, 80s, you know, I, Crown one Vic. of them. Crown Vic frame with a 740i motor drive shaft all around and, and running gear and brakes and it would have been really cool to see this rolls royce on a racetrack doing doing very fast things because it would have been a manual swap and all the rest of the stuff um but i think at some point like reality brain kicked back on and it was like this is just the, the windshield alone is worth more than any of our other cars um and so yeah what flavor of rolls royce was it 66 something same kind of deal silver so shot similar i know i know nothing about these cars this mm -hmm. one had an engine in it but okay it i mean that's all I, that's <laughs> oh, fascinating of, I mean, uh, stay tuned on the carmudgeon show for more important yeah, information about cars bill took one of the valve covers when he sold it and just put it on the wall in the shop just because mm -hmm. you know it's probably the most expensive thing in the shop <laughs> um, interesting yeah those rules is just i have no yeah they are no not athletic cars they are um artifacts of automobiling i guess and they're the the earliest rolls that I drove. It was, it was an eighty three. I think it was a it was a parrot yellow eighty three silver. What the hell was it? It was a convertible. Corniche. It was a Corniche two convertible. That's what it was. And I did donuts in it in a high school parking lot. <laughs> I was like eighteen, and you give an eighteen year old the keys to this canary yellow shit pile rolls and it was so fucking slow. Yeah, I just remember like trying to get on the highway, and it was like 41, 42. 43, 44, 45. And it was Canadian spec. So it was, those are kilometers. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. But it was just, it was dangerously slow. Mm. Um, and then you'd get another one. It would be fast as shit. So I, I remember I drove a couple of them back in the day and they were so variable. And some were slow, some were fast. Sensitive to maintenance. And, and they were just wretched relics of the 1920s <laughs> dragged into the 1980s. And I just, I just did not have an appreciation for. for I like them. That's not a guilty pleasure for me. Okay, a 19, 18 year old, whatever, it probably doesn't get that. But I just thought, like, what? Where's, where's the beef? Like, what? How much money for this thing? And this is just shitty switch gear. And you know, like the, the selector gear selector was cool because it wasn't. It was yes, just a little it's an electric switch. switch. It was dainty, but the whole car just felt like okay. Somebody who's an engineer needs to get over here and update this stuff because it's all fifty years old. That was my feeling at the time. Mm. I'm sure they're. 
cool. I like them. It depends. They're very variable. There's certain ones that you're just like, I have no interest in. And of course, the, the spiciest ones are the ones that most interest me. There's a history of not Rolls Royce, but Bentley taking yeah. the same stuff and making spicy cars out of it. So in the 50s, you had the R-Type Continental, which is still one of my favorite cars. I, I love the fact that, like the Bugatti Veyron, uh, a new tire had to be developed for the car that could withstand both the speed and the weight. That Isn't this that also car the case for the W140 Mercedes? Would not surprise me yeah. if that were the case. I am pretty Anytime sure. a tire manufacturer has to invent a new tire for a car, I'm interested. I think that is a sign of... I3. <laughs> I3 uh, was a bespoke tire. Uh, oh, okay, come on. Don't okay. you want it? It looks like a little bulldog. No. Inbred. Absolutely. Bulldog. Aren't they... <laughs> generally inbred isn't that how they end up I, this is the problem is my friend who just bought an i3 is going to watch this fucking show <laughs> We're gonna get... no he's not he's... yeah he is he just sent me the screen grabs of we have a group a chat group with a bunch of friends two of whom have nc1s and i just got a video of his tv last week where we shit all over nc1s we're like they're terrible if you've ever if you own an nc1 don't drive an nc2 and whatever it was that we said which was not nice wound up going to the group of my friends who own them um, like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's, how do we dig out of this? Give me a second. I'm going to come up with something. Uh, the, the NC2 is a better version of the NC1. <laughs> there. It's not I that nice. It. If, compared no, there, there to are any another, other, compared to NA and B, NC was a friggin' revelation. But it got an order. But of they dramatically two. improved it. For NC2. Yes. That doesn't mean NC1 is a bad car, guys. Sorry. I'm just I'm always in trouble. But that i3 can go fuck itself. Mm -hmm. That for that I will say, and I'm gonna stand by that. And he's asked me a couple times why I think that car is so terrible. And it just starts Do you out, want to? Yeah, let's do it. Well, it just starts out very simple. As as my job as a journalist to sort of remove my own my own feelings on the car and look at this car objectively in terms of engineering and did it move the bar? Did it raise the needle? We always, <laughs> I always do that. Um, and BMW purchased a company or a plant that did carbon fiber and, and spent an exorbitant amount of money making this car out of carbon fiber. It was hugely expensive to develop, hugely expensive to build. Um, and ultimately those benefits did not come through to the customer. So, the idea behind the car was a mega city vehicle, and that should include the ease, ease of repairing. And at the beginning, those cars were four or $500 a month to insure because it's a, an aluminum skateboard chassis, which was way taller than it needed to be uh, to house the batteries, and then mm -hmm. a carbon passenger cell on t glued to it. And then carbon body panels that were bolted to that. So if you got smacked in a fender, it was a carbon panel. You just throw it out, replace it. It was expensive. That was part of the insurance claim. However, or the insurance uh, premium. However, if you had any substantial accident and you damaged the safety cell, that had to be cut out and replaced. The part that you damaged, cut out and replaced. And that's, there was no, there were nobody. Yes, just take it down to the body shop on the corner. Yeah, right, exactly. And so that's a problem. And when you're when you're trying to be a mega city vehicle, that the, the whole idea of this is ease of ownership and fixing and everything else. Well, then you fucking failed. The the other big issue on the car was structurally. I don't remember why, but it needed to have the the the. Um, uh, suicide doors suicide doors which means that if you get out and open the back door and you're parked next to another car in a parking lot you're trapped can't get out your back passenger can't get out unless you as the driver unbuckle unbuckle your belt um because your belt is on their door if i remember correctly there was just there's awkwardness to the use of the car that shouldn't be there for what is supposed to be a, a, an invisible tool that just gets you from a to b and then the biggest fucking joke of it all was all the weight savings and the mil billions of dollars in the carbon plant and everything else resulted in a car that did not beat the e-golf in range and, and by range i mean efficiency number of miles traveled per kilowatt hour of battery mm -hmm. and my the only thing that matters when you have at that point a 20 something kilowatt hour battery which is three quarters of a gallon of fuel that's the all the energy you have on board the only thing that matters is range is efficiency because you need the range you're maximizing that. yes didn't beat a compliance car that was just a fucking golf with an electric motor and a battery in it and then to do not better than the than the golf, it had 155 front tires on it. I think the 185s or 175s in the back. No grip. And then to get shitty handling and no grip, 
somehow it also rode like a dump truck. I, don't I, it? Don't worry. It's beautiful though, so that fixes it. <laughs> what happened? It was every so. That's the reason I don't like it. I'm I'm, I'm being silly. I, I hate it. Um, but, but there, it was every compromise resulted in more compromises. It resulted in there was no payoff. Okay, it was quick and it was rear drive. Okay, that was great. So it was nice. The problem is you can't regen going down a hill in a rear drive car without locking up the rear wheels. So you're going down a hill and you hit the tiniest little bump. And San Francisco is admittedly very hilly and it's slightly exceptional in that sense. But you go hit the tiniest little bump or pavement seam or whatever, and it locks the rear wheels up, rear, rear wheels up momentarily, which engages the traction control, which disengages regen. So the car takes off. It doesn't actually take off, but it no longer is not dis accelerating. And the, your impression as a driver is, whoa, fuck, what the fuck? Mm. And it doesn't do well in sidewinds. It was just a compromised package that had a really pretty interior. Mm. There. I, I was just going there. to say, what is the nicest thing you can say about it? Uh, but you been, just did. No, the nicest thing I can say about it is was killed off. Mm. Out of production. Failure. Perfect example of German engineering. In the and I'm sorry, perfect example of the bad side of German engineering. Add layer after layer after layer of complexity for no benefit whatsoever. Mm. When even under Piech, we will do the Piech episode one day, under Piech, that Mark 7 Golf beat it in fucking every measure. More interior space, better ride, better NVH, better handling, all of the stuff. And it was just a friggin' compliance car. It's a shit golf. <laughs> Mm -hmm. get off my lawn okay that is, um, that not was, a guilty pleasure that's no. a that's a not whatever a guilty, the opposite of nope. guilty unpleasure well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> opposite of a guilty I have thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right what is the most out you've never owned anything american no but not for lack of trying yeah you, you haven't tried you've been talking about some galaxy 500 yeah, for yeah. i mean i years. put down a deposit on it and flew out to buy it and it was shitty when i got there so i didn't buy it Mm. but I will own one at some point. The reason why I haven't in all, you know, more than a decade of shopping is that they, those cars are not going up in value. So uh, and no so pressure. I'm always like, oh, I should just buy something. You know, in that same period, I bought a, you know, choose Radwood era car that doubled in value, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm like, oh, those things will be there. Yeah, fair enough. And so eventually I will. They're also space. They take up a lot of space. Yeah, Would one even fit in... Uh, I confirmed garage? actually that the length is within, um, it's four inches longer than a long wheelbase W140. Oh, and that fits. And it fits. Garage. Yeah. You're, now that you're in your bureaucratic <clears throat> era. Yes. So, you know, there's no real excuse other than that they're not going up in value. They've gone up mm -hmm. like a little bit, but anyway, yes. So that like vintage American cars generally, for sure, a guilty pleasure Same. of mine, especially if it's got this, a raucous engine. It has know? to. Yeah. Is there anything American from the 50s, 60s, or 70s that you'd want that doesn't have a V8 in it? Mm, 1949 Buick. Straight eight? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. Anything with it. Is there, that could be in a whole episode. Is there, has there ever been an uncool straight eight? Um, mm, different story. Probably. But yeah, straight eights don't count. Like, you know, okay. and I said 50s. Uh, uh, oh, okay. But you Fine, know, like you're a, right. a four cylinder. Is there anything? I'm interested to try. I recently watched a video of a, because I was doing research on the, uh, the, the Buick Rover V8. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the cars that got that engine was available also with like a three liter inline four or something like that. And I found one um, that was listed on Bring a Trailer. And there was a driving video and I listened to it and I was like, this is kind of cool, actually. It like had character and fizz mm. and sounded kind of spicy. And I was like, this is pretty interesting. So it's called the trophy in line four. It's a large displacement mm. in line four that was available in these things so like i'm interested to see what that's like i mean like what about a cosworth vega you know, know that could be kind of cool yeah. um i did drive i mean obviously not at all athletic but uh a 1966 ford pickup truck with a mm. six cylinder a big six cylinder mm. you know with a it's technically a four speed but first gear was a granny gear so you used it mm. like a three-speed dog leg and like that thing i drove around a bunch in and i was like this thing's actually kind of funny and amusing and charming by so. virtue of its non 
modernness. Yes. Say, right? Yes. It's truckishness. That's right. <laughs> really. But it was like surprisingly swift. Like it would go down the road at 85 miles an hour. Like, really? Yeah, yeah. I was very surprised. That's shocking. A 66 Ford F100 pickup going. Like, Those, it, it, it was, I think that straight six wound up into the go, driving, going to the 80s, right? Probably. I, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. You know, my buddy's base, dad had like a late 70s, early 80s Ford that had, it was, I don't remember what the hell it was. It had a straight six in it. It was, it was it did big, 80. No big, problem. Big on inline sixes. I mean, this is also like what powered the Jeep XJ mm-hmm. into the 2000s or late 90s. Uh, and it was in the yeah. the Grand Wagoneer. So I mean, but it's not a it's not a uh, intrinsically exciting motor. Although I did um, ride in a Curtis five hundred, which had a, one of those American inline sixes that someone had built a spicy version out of. As much as you can, I mean, they're they're not even cross flow, mm. so you know, it's not going to ever do 7,000 RPM and it was supercharged and it sounded spicy and it had supercharger and it was fast and it was if very 1950s. And that was a really exciting experience. So, you know, yeah, American cars that aren't V8s, a few, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, straight eights uh, we've disqualified cause I'm sure that a Duesenberg SJ, which, um, yes, a couple things about that engine. It's, um, four valves per cylinder. Dual over SJ. Yes. Yeah. 1929. This is where It's a Doozy came from. Yes. For the, let's be very clear. Yes. It was that car probably. That I think it was, it's un- pretty unarguably. I mean, even compared to Bugatti's, like possibly the finest car in the world at the time. But yeah, 32 valves um, and dual overhead cams. Uh, and I think they were maybe gear driven also, wow. which was common back then. Uh, so yes, I, American cars being guilty pleasures for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you need the the big V8, but not always. I mean, like uh, uh, Packards. I genuinely enjoy interacting with Packards. They're high quality. Anything that's that old is yeah, charming. That's true because it's just so different so that different. no matter what yeah. it is, it's yeah. going to be an interesting experience, experience. with a lot of texture. Mm-hmm. Uh, Do anything Japanese? You have a Miata. Uh-huh. Have you done a lot of other stuff? Oh, I had a two forty Z. Yeah, which I really enjoyed. That I regret see. selling that car yeah, very stupid. much. That I mean, stupid. I needed a down payment. I was looking into sofa cushions for money for for house, first house. So yeah, blah 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 blah. No. Excuses, <clears throat> excuses. <laughs> uh, but yeah, neither of us is very into Japanese cars, and people always request Japanese car content from us, and we're like, mm, we like kind of know stuff. We, really, we don't have a lot of first person experience Japanese car ownership. I don't, except that I've driven some of the coolest stuff. I mean, that the 2000 GT was, I've driven quite a bit. That's a it's top amazing. 10 car for me, regardless yeah. of. Every Z I've driven has been magic. Every? Not every, but almost every. It's, well, the Z432 is unbelievable. Sorry, but I'm talking about like Z, you know, like 300 ZX twin turbo. No, I'm talking about like a first uh, gen. Yeah, every uh, of the early yeah. Zs that um, you've driven. Uh, yeah, but I'm in a Honda S800, S600. I, I have a Beat. Mm-hmm. I mean, that makes me a Japanese car aficionado. But no, I mean, there's, I don't have all that much experience with Japanese stuff, except the I have a huge amount of respect. 80s Hondas and 80s and 90s Toyotas are just, I mean, put me, I just got, I just sat in a Crown, a 97, 98 Crown, and it's a lot of 92 to 96 Camry interior mm-hmm. bits. Um, and I realized like, wow, that Camry was that good that they could use all this stuff in a Crown. I have, I have a huge amount of respect there. I just don't necessarily want to own a 92 Camry. Yes. I would like to look at one. They're beautiful. Yeah, it's definitely so agree. It's so weird that we both feel this way. Like that you know, and I mean, laughs anyone who has eyes, I would yeah. agree that it's probably the best looking Camry ever made. But then they would say that's not a very high bar. I know. I was re- t- biting my tongue just then, <laughs> waiting for you to say something other than that's not a very but high I, bar. I really think it's a beautiful, beautifully <laughs> styled car. Yeah, but what, I mean, it ha- I'm sure it has to do with our socialization, right? And this is something that people don't talk about a lot as it relates to cars, but your interest in cars has a lot to do with your early influences during your formative car years. And who is that person or persons who shaped your car enthusiasm? Yeah. And, you know, what did they introduce you to when you were an impressionable young car enthusiast? Yeah. And that definitely bears out in my own car experiences. And so we can go on and experience things that are really remarkable to us like uh, i don't know choose thing 2000 gt for me genuinely is a top 10 car if i could you know if you gave me a pile of money and said you had to buy 10 cars only a 2000 gt would be in that mm. in those 10 cars for me um 
but for the most part, yeah, Japanese cars. But but also the reason for that is because the car is basically a European car, but a, rendered in a Japanese way. Yeah. It's not uh, it's not forging any new path just yet. The way that the Japanese eventually figured out how to do after they right. figured out how to do what Europeans were doing as well or better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so my early experiences were with with European cars, and that's why that's where most of my you know, these are intrinsically emotional purchases. Mm-hmm. We all are like out there trying to explain why, you know, yes, I need to buy a BMW i3 because it fits with my urban lifestyle or whatever. But ultimately, it's some kind of emotional thing yeah, that we true. are, you know, if we, for those of us, you know, who ha- are willing to take the effort to try and rationalize it and put a little bit of effort into developing some argument, whatever the mm-hmm. argument is, you're right. like, I like this thing and it makes a lot of sense because, you know, Thursdays, sometimes I need back seats, <laughs> right. you know, or whatever it is. Uh, and But the reality is they've chosen that particular argument. <laughs> Yes, because they because they the want the thing, or they want a feeling, or it makes them feel a certain right. way, and that's what you know. What is it with you and your shitty old Volkswagens, which is an early car mudgeon episode? Mm-hmm. It's about certain feelings. Yep. So uh, yes, some of those are guilt, guilty pleasures. There, I yeah. wrapped it all around. <laughs> well, and uh, yeah, to that end, the I think my list of cars that I would buy today, the, uh, modern cars. The, I don't. I I struggle a lot with this. Am I just that old man, jaded journalist who's driven everything and not excited about everything, or has the car industry just really gone in a direction that's not catering to enthusiasts? I mean, the fact that you can find experiences somewhere in the automotive history—they just don't happen to be current ones that uh, still excite you—means that you know that. Yeah, but I should be excited about new stuff. I should. Well, be new stuff about, should be exciting. Yeah, and it's not. But yeah, so I mean, I've had, Anthony's 14 years younger than I am, and he's not interested in anything new either. So that helps me feel better about myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in my very, 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 very short list of modern cars that I would actually buy, um, you know, you have the 86, I would actually buy a Toyota GR86 or BRZ, um, but also <laughs> F-150 Raptor. R. Which are pretty bookendy. That's my guilty that's the that's drag right it's putting on a wig and heels and you know and appearing oh to be that somebody. drag <laughs> not <laughs> drag race which i do it's a good tv show but i would do the drag racing thing at the, at the racetrack all of it i mean it's just you're putting on enough chris bangle was a man that i actively campaigned to have removed from the face of the earth until i met him um and i didn't even meet him i i watched a, a, a talk. presentation a talk that he did and he's genius the man st- fucking ruined bmw styling but for all the most amazing reasons possible and backed into the, these amazing explanations of why they did it i'm sort of half joking there but he is really really smart and really really uh charismatic and he made the point that every car is uh is an avatar it's the once you're inside it's no longer you and we do this too i mean i'm prejudiced against subarus i hate them I see a Subaru on the road and I automatically hate that person and I want to get around them because I'm convinced they are going to be slow and in my fucking way and not paying attention. And 90% of the time I'm right because that's how prejudice works. Well, Um, no, what you are doing is you're doing, I think this is a heuristic. It's a type of, um, we can't, we can, every single person we meet, we can't judge them with a blank slate, right? You are always taking shortcuts to be like every and every time that I've had the situation in the past when I saw this and then that happened, like okay, so then you just use that as a shortcut to right. bypass having to, you know, reach a traffic light right. and be like, well, like people seem to be going when it's green, so I'm going to do that. Right. Like you just develop these shortcuts mm-hmm. logically, which is like. You take the inputs to your brain and eye holes mm-hmm. and whatever else, and then you turn it into like behavior in the future right. as a, a, a time saving yeah. measure. Yeah. So, right. and Subaru drivers prove that. So they just continue to prove me yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. However, um, though I'm not judging the person who's driving that car. I mean, I am kind of like, what What does it take for you to drive a CVT shitbox? But the reality Active is. Active disinterest in motoring. Bangle was right. Yes. Bangle was right. It's it's an avatar. It's an outfit that you put on, and every once in a while, it's fun to put on someone else's clothes. And some something we can't really do in in the world. I can't walk into a building looking like you, or sounding like you, or using nineteen twenties terminology the way you do. Um, by the way, I was thinking you were there on the Titanic when it uh, the original one, right? Not these. This is why I hate cold water. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think it's very fun to put on somebody else's clothes and drive a car that you would never ever ever drive. Yeah. And funny enough. My top car of the year is a car that is just so not me in any way, but made me laugh more than anything else. 
Yeah, and I think that the same thing for, for, you know, my equivalent is probably American cars from the 60s, where you have this sort of reputation or image of being really raw. But that's ultimately the appeal is that there's this like intense sensory experience. And that's the same case for you with this truck is that there is a sensory experience. There is some content there. There's amusement right. there. Well, that was, this, first of all, look, the car, and from an objective journalistic standpoint, a Raptor does everything you expect it to. It is a product that is what it says it is on the box, and therefore it's a success as far as I'm concerned. And when you look at against, at against its competition, it's a it's real reason. It's amazing right. that someone chose a box and said, let's have a, put these you know descriptions on the outside yeah. of the box of a right. product that does this. Exactly. And But then the fact that it just, does i mean it would end badly if i owned one i mean i just i would be imagine i uh, yeah i would just be such a i was for a couple of days such a terrible person on the road gleefully <laughs> terrorizing sh- terrorizing and then anthony was driving the rover the sdr new sd1 he was behind me and every time i took off it would lay a couple hundred feet of black stripes even you know without spinning tires because those tires are pretty soft and he was like it just looked dangerous it just looked dangerous. It was like this car is just out of fucking control and gone. It's you know rear yeah. over on one and rear the, wheel. And there's just, a lot of body motion. Yeah, and so- constant. And that, yeah. he said it was just hilarious. It was genuinely scary to watch. Um, and then you know, scary laugh, scary laugh. And what better experience? I don't know. Anyway, that's uh, being alive. That that is a car mention episode. It's being alive is having experiences. I I think you should go rent a Kia Sophia. Uh, from some used car lot. I think someone would pay me to drive it. I want to see Derek in something. I want to see Derek in drag, in Kia drag. Uh, Gross. (laughs) All right, that was episode number 103-ish. Sure. Of the Car Mudgeon Show. Thanks for joining. See you next time. Next week. Week. Next week. Next Next week. week There's no holidays coming up, right? That's right. Bye. What is it, Jason? Hello. Hello. Weren't you supposed, weren't you supposed to read something? Uh, read something. Oh, uh, yes. Um, Lucid had some mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. that they wanted us to, to share. Yep. Uh, so, yes, what did they say? Let me read here. Once upon a time... Oh, no, wait. Uh, every car margin listener knows about the Lucid Air. Mm-hmm. The longest range, fastest charging luxury electric car in the world. It's mm-hmm. designed in California, assembled in Arizona, and Jason over there on your side of the screen... Uh, has made more than a few videos about its incredible performance. What you might not know about, however, is the special lease and finance offers available on 2023 models of the Lucid Air Touring and Grand Touring. Get a new lease on electric. Visit lucidmotors.com for offer details. Uh, I think that's all I have to say on that subject. But anyway, yeah, like we've got a sponsor. Mega exciting. Uh, Is there anything else we needed to cover? No, I think that's it. Okay, splendid. Uh, then in that case, let's get back to the uh, original uh, episode. Excuse me. Sorry. Yep, Thanks. No Thanks. Bye. Okay, see ya.